This, again, Jay mentioned this is our third annual Food of Palooza, and uh, you know, it's bigger and better than ever. And so, again, thank you all for coming. I, I know some of you have been here for three straight years, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, and it really shows the commitment that some of you have here in, in Central Louisiana. And, and many of you uh, are, are reaching that commitment as well. Before I move forward, I, I do want to point out some of the partners and funders that have worked with, with us throughout the, the first two and a half years. You know, first off, the Blue Cross and Blue Shields Louisiana Foundation, uh, right over here, and, and also Annette representing uh, the Refuse Foundation at Pennington as well. And as well as, you know, this is a collaborative effort. You know, collaborative now has become a buzzword, but I think it, it, it's reality in what we're trying to do. So with the Food Bank of Central Louisiana and the Good Food Project and, and Market Umbrella, which is based out of New Orleans, uh, and the Louisiana Public Health Institute, and also, you know, we, we've been kind of gaining some partners. So the Cane River Green Market in Natchitoches, uh, the Wynn Farmers Market in Winfield, as well as the uh, new Leesville Main Street Market in Garden Up Third are all implementing Market Match, which is a program of the Central Louisiana Local Food Initiative that's being implemented in partnership with Market Umbrella again out of New Orleans. So again, this couldn't be possible without all of our partners. And you know, I, I do want to point out too, and I, I kind of gave the same challenge last year. So this isn't a TV show, right? So when we watch TV, we sit around, usually our hands are on the couch, and, and we watch it and we leave, and we don't do anything about it. And so my challenge to everybody here, again, is to be an active participant, engaged in these workshops. So when you go in, whether it's composting or how to involve youth in the garden or microbrewing, uh, think about how you can bring those skills that you learn and the knowledge that you gain back to your own communities. Because again, the community, you know, the local food movement cannot grow without the support of every single citizen in central Louisiana. And you know, that can be just going back and, and showing your neighbor how to compost, inviting me to your party with your new uh, microbrew. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter, it can be anything. So I, I just want to challenge you all to, to really take these workshops seriously. The, the presenters we have are, are the best we've ever had here at Foodapalooza, um, and, and the workshop leaders, the resources in the room. And you know, I do want to take a moment to point out that we have the Central Louisiana Local Food Working Group, which is really, you know, Ann, Ann Chapney up there is the chair of that group. It's, it's really the engine that, that motors this initiative. Uh, so as we, as we talk about it being a grassroots movement, we need folks who dedicate at least a few hours a month Many more, many, many times over that uh, for many of them to actually sit down and really identify those opportunities and challenges in our region and figure out how to move the initiative forward. So, if you're part of the working group, can you just stand up for a minute or less than a minute? <laughs> so, yeah, it, you can give him a hand if you like. <laughs> and so, these are the lead, you know, these are leaders in the room. So when you go to the workshop, when you're out networking, I gave you some extra time to network uh, in, in the program, you know, find, seek these leaders out and, and ask them how you can be involved and how, ask them you know, what resources they can share. Because we have leaders and we have champions in this room and at the ground level, we don't utilize them enough. We always look at the people who come from far away as the, as the champions and experts. And they're often our experts from far away that come here and share resources. But they're experts here in this room, too. So let's not forget that. That's part of Buda Palooza, to really inspire those uh, to become more involved in the movement. And you know, and Jim kind of gave a background of where we've been and, and why we're doing this. And, and I'll quickly kind of hopefully lead you to where we're going. So Buda Palooza, again, is an opportunity for you all to learn more about the general movement, how you can evolve. As an economic development agency, we know that there are needs in the region. And so we've kind of started looking at the infrastructural needs, whether that's distribution, uh, freezing, aggregation center for, for our farmers. But we know, you know, and so looking at that study, looking at the next steps, we really called around across the country to folks and asked them, what can we do differently? Where do, where, what are our next steps from an economic standpoint? And many said, oh, just build a food hub. People will come. You know, people, people will throw food, at, food into that thing and everything, all your problems will be solved. And we heard that over and over and over again. And, you know, we called around, we called around, and finally, we, we were recommended pretty early in the process, actually, uh, 
to call Catherine Perry a backlash in sustainable development. It was just a breath of fresh air. You know, she comes from a business background. She knows that, and she agrees with Kalita, and, and so we kind of are mutual in this, that if this is going to be sustainable, farmers have to be prosperous. If, if this is going to work, if we're going to be a sustainable movement, farmers have to make money, and we have to support those farmers. And so talking to Kathleen, who's our keynote presenter uh, this morning, you know, she gets that. And so we're, we're talking about who, who's going to be the keynote presenter uh, at Food of Blues. And this was a couple months ago, and I was searching, and somehow online, this might be wrong, but you have a degree from Texas A&M, right? So I just, I'm not from the South, but I just want to point out, I don't have a joke about Texas A&M versus LSU yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping to have one by the time I got on stage, I still don't. So I apologize. But, you know, that was, that was one thing. I saw the Texas A&M, and I said, she's got to come. And uh, so afterwards, she's driving to meet her sister. But, you know, it's such a pleasure for us to bring in experts and, and, and people who are recommended from folks in New York City and Los Angeles and Chicago. You should call Catherine Terry at Appalachian Sustainable Development. She'll, she'll lead you in the right path. And so our study that we received a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture in October to implement a local food infrastructure study we're conducting that study now. We're going to have the results of that study to help us identify the next steps, hopefully the next two months. And so Kathleen really helped us really focus in on that study. What do we want that study to look like? So, you know, before coming to Appalachian Sustainable Development in 2006, Kathleen had over 20 years of business experience. Uh, she joined Appalachian Sustainable Development again in 2006 as a business operations manager, and then in 2011 became executive director. Appalachian Sustainable Development is a nonprofit that works throughout Southern Appalachia and Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee. And so what's really great for us is that, you know, not only do they work with forestry products and helping to empower local citizens and throughout the region, uh, increasing food access, helping develop a local food system, but they built in our managing a food hub that brings in millions of dollars back into the local food system in Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee. Uh, that sounds great, and we knew that when we talked to Kathleen, we found out that there are a lot of challenges to make that happen, which is one of the reasons she's here too, is to share those opportunities and challenges with, you know, the next steps. How do we make, take this to the next level? So it's my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Terry of Appalachian Sustainable Development. So... Did, am I on? Um, I don't know if y'all know how lucky you are to have Kalita. We don't have a Kalita, and, and they are, I'm just so excited to be here and, and very honored because, uh, sort of, because I think they look at me as kind of the canary in the mines and, and like, well, we don't want to go there. So I'm a good, um, I'm a good uh, example, if not role model. So uh, I'm, um, I'm really excited to be here. I have a presentation just to keep me on task, but if, People want, if y'all want to fire questions at me, I'm in the middle of something, I'm fine with that. It's, um, it's about how I can help and, and maybe just inform just from our experience. Um, so I just want to give you just a, an overview of who ASD is, just so that you can kind of have a sense of, of where we're coming from and, and kind of our approach. Our mission is to grow food, communities, and opportunities to build a thriving Appalachia. I think our communities are not dissimilar, and I, I think that's part of the reason that they, they talk to me. We're very, very rural, and we don't have like an urban center right next to us, just like, just like y'all don't. Um, so where we work is very remote, more remote than, than here. I was looking with a little bit of envy at all of the markets that y'all have that are relatively close to you. Markets meaning like you have you know, Shreveport and Baton Rouge and places like that that, that are s decent sized um, places. And, and ours, Alexandria would be the decent sized place. That's as big as we would have. Um, we have a lot more challenging topography and geography than you do. Um, I, I put a picture of, of cows up there because when I first moved there, I was from, I'm from Texas and obviously not used to mountains. And, and the first, um, one of my first favorite sayings I heard was steeper than the cow's face. And so <laughs> this just reminds me of how different it is than it is here. Um, one thing that we do have 
um, that you may not have here is access to most of the population of the country within a pretty decent, um, you know, four or five hundred mile range. And that's, that's pretty good because it's a lot of options and opportunities for us. Um, we do have a lot of poverty, um, not many economic options, and a, and a long history of really extractive industries. You have different issues down here that, that have eroded trust. Up there, it is all extractive industries that have eroded the trust that people have. So if you come in as a nonprofit, you're automatically suspect. Um, so um, John mentioned that we are a nonprofit. We are turning 20 this year, so we're almost legal. And um, we have 10 different programs. And so usually it's kind of hard for us to talk about what ASD does succinctly, but I will try. Um, the three different sectors that we operate in are the sustainable forestry and wood products, um, food system development, and food access. The, I, I won't talk much about the forestry part, but just to say, um, I'll talk about the two things that we're doing only to give you some examples. One of the things um, that both Jim and John said is it's partnerships, it's creativity, and it is, you've seen one instance of something, you've seen one instance of it. You know, So if you've seen one food hub, the, they're all different. Um, and so we have different approaches to different things based on what's happening in a region, what people are doing. So if you look at our, our agroforestry and our wood products programs are, are pretty good examples of two completely different approaches. Our agroforestry is we're trying to protect um, riparian buffer zones, your stream banks that are really suffering and eroding as well as promote sustainable forestry and, and good conservation practices, but we're not working with a population that has the bandwidth to think about that. They really, that, that is not what they wanna invest in. So what we're doing is we're, plan, we're working with them and the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, and US Fish and Wildlife Service to plant pro producing, um, food producing plants and trees in riparian buffer zones. So then they're not sacrificing anything, they're actually getting a product. And our role in that is just to do the planning and landowner outreach and, and all of that. But we're working with NRCS to try and help them change their practices to make that easier. Woodwright, on the other hand, is an enterprise. And that whole purpose of it is we are trying to help mills in Appalachia stay in business, the few that are left. So we've got all of these mills that used to produce products for homes, and then when the housing market tanked, so did they. And so we lost probably fully 40% of our capacity. Well, all these mills still have, were paying for their equipment, and so there's an opportunity there for them to ramp up some production level. We just need to figure out ramp up what. And we're competing with you know, really cheap products, and we don't want to be the lowest cost. So what we've done, we've gone into the urban centers like Charlotte, North Carolina, which has a thriving green building um, movement, and we, got, we find jobs for those Appalachian manufacturers and bring those back to Appalachia. And then we discovered that well, we need more than just flooring, so we've now come up with this really cool product called Stackwood that is easy to make, but we patented it and are teaching um, all of our different partners, the supply partners, how to make these products. So those are just completely different product, different projects. And they are just dependent upon what was there and what was needed. Um, we address food in two different ways. Most of our farmers are limited resource. We can't go to them and expect them to give all their food away to those in need or to, to do the absolute rock bottom dollar so that that can be super affordable. But we also acknowledge that there's a lot of hungry people in our area and we've got to do something about it. And so we've really been deliberate about approaching those two things differently. Um, we, on the food access side, are really focusing on how do you teach people or reteach them how to grow their own food? How do, how do you give them back that power to do that when so many of them have lost it? And I don't know if that's the same here. Um, a lot of times when you're in a rural area, area, people think that everybody grows their own food. And most of what we've learned is that like a generation and a half or two generations, like, I'm not breaking beans anymore. I don't want to do that. But that's a sign of poverty, and I don't want to have to grow my own food. And so we're trying to break that thinking and get people back doing that. And, and part of that work is when you've got extra, we can help you sell it 
because there isn't enough supply coming in a lot of times to different places. So we, we approach those differently. We also, um, our Healthy Families Family Farms program is something that I think was genius. I didn't come up with it. Um, but if, you, if you've ever grown any food, you know that a lot of it is seconds and it doesn't really make the grade for a, a wholesale market. And what do you do with that? You don't want to leave it in the field. So, and if you don't have a processing facility around here to make it into a, some other product, there's not much you can do with it. So we raise money <coughs> from the community, like faith-based areas and, and small grants, and we buy those seconds from produce, uh, from farmers, and then we deliver it to and donate it to food banks and food pantries so that they can give it away. Am I doing something? Should I move my arms a different way? Um, but um, we, that, that program has just been phenomenal because we're trying to get food into places that is mostly processed and, and really unhealthy products. Um, so we do a bunch of different, those, so I don't want to ton, spend a ton of time on that, but because I think one of the things that um, folks most want to hear about is the food hub. Does anybody know what a food hub is? Have you all heard of that term before? Um, basically, it it's, takes on many, many different forms, but in essence, it is a way of getting product from farmers, usually small-scale farmers, into different wholesale avenues. Um, and it, it could be grocery store chains, it could be restaurants, it just kind of depends on what the market is that you're trying to serve. The ones that are the most sustainable are near urban areas and can have access to a bunch of different types, a nice diversity of um, buyers. Um, you're not much different here than we are in terms of, yeah, you have a little bit of that. Seven restaurants, probably not going to get you going. Um, it'll get you started. Um, Appalachian Harvest is the name of our food hub, and I've had to train myself to call it a food hub because that wasn't even in existence back in the day. Um, it started in, in 2000, and the whole reason for its existence was that tobacco, which was always heavily subsidized, those subsidies were going away, and so what were our farmers going to do? What could they grow? And so um, our founder at the time had the idea that they should grow organic produce, which it's about as far from tobacco as you can get in terms of <laughs> everything. And, um, but the reason that they picked that was because it made a whole lot of money per acre. But you've got to realize that it's a whole lot more work, a whole lot more skills. It's not like you plant it, spray all kinds of chemicals on it, and then come back in the fall and ha harvest it. I mean, it's just, you know, harvest it once and you get your check right then, too. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at you because it's like, yeah, that just doesn't happen. Um, it takes a little bit more effort to do organic vegetable production. Um, we have, because of where we're located, um, y'all probably don't know a whole lot more about Virginia and ge geography than I did when I got there. And because coming from Texas, I was like, well, everything's smaller than Texas. And, and then I get there, and I'm like, my god, this state never ends. It's huge. <laughs> and we're in the part of Virginia that, that even Virginia doesn't own. They think it stops about <laughs> 200 miles from where we are. And so we're in this weird no man's land, but, but we do have access to Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky. Um, and, and so we can get a lot of places relatively quickly. But again, like I said earlier, there's not much in the way of markets. So we end up going to distribution centers for grocery store <coughs> chains and produce brokers because it is the cheapest way to distribute product in a tractor trailer. Um, we're all about fresh produce. Um, fortunately, hopefully, now it's coming true that we actually have a value-added suite of products that we are getting in to our to these buyers, which we've never had before. Um, we have, because we suffered from the whole build it, they will come, build it bigger, and even more people will come, and teach them how to do it, and more people will come, and that just to me does not hold true. Economics kind of goes off the rails with farming because we don't pay enough to drag a bunch of farmers in. So um, we have a 15,000 square foot facility, which I think now in retrospect could be like five or 6,000. Um, but now we got just lots of room to move around. Um, about a third of it is uh, refrigerated. And then we have two tractor trailers. Um, I, um, th there's a bunch of different services that we offer. Mostly what we do is we sell the products and we market them and we will deliver them 
to the distribution centers. We work with farmers um, to help them access uh, different inputs or seeds, boxes for a reduced rate. So we kind of work with different partners to, to get buy them in bulk. Again, I guess that's a positive when you got the warehouse, you can store, you know, a tractor trailer load of boxes there. Um, we, all of our markets require GAP certification. I don't know if y'all are familiar with good agricultural practices, sort of food safety certification. If not, you will be, um, it's coming. Um, we have had to deal with it for the last six or so years. We have little teeny farmers accessing really big markets and so they were hit harder than anybody else. And, and so we whined and complained about it the most and have had to learn how to deal with it and, and really have a, a pretty solid approach. Our sales every year are about at a million and a half right now. We need to be at about two to break even. Um, so after 15 years, we're still not there. And, and we're a whole heck of a lot closer than we ever were. I think in 2014, we are still 14% grant funded. And good Lord willing and the creek don't rise, my other saying I learned up there, um, <laughs> we will break even this year. Um, so, a lot of people have had questions about our business model, and um, I had someone tell me once, you know, Kathleen, it's not a social enterprise if you still need grants. It's a program, and I'm like, shut up. I like to call it an enterprise, and, and it is not. It's still a program, but we're really, our goal is that it is, it, it is an enterprise, and maybe it won't stand on its own. Maybe it'll always be a part of the nonprofit, but, but the point is, and this took me a long time to learn, the point of a nonprofit is not to start up something else that loses money. You know, it needs to be financially viable um, because if we don't get grants, the farmers that came to rely on us are worse off than they were before because then they've built up and spent money to try and be farmers and then you lose that thing that, that you were counting on to connect you with your market. So that is horribly risky and you just shouldn't count on the USDA always having a passion for food hubs. Um, and, and has, as um, someone who has a horrible distaste and dislike for writing grants, partly because I'm from the business world, I'm like, my God, this is a waste of time because the, the, you wouldn't do this in business, and, but you do it um, because you need to, but you don't want to suffer from the whims. You don't want your farmers and the people you're there to help to suffer from your failures to, to get a grant. Um, the way we work is, I don't know how, if it'll be like it is here, but I, I kind of look at the way we um, manage to keep Appalachian Harvest open is sort of this patchwork of rural type behavior where you've got like four different jobs and you earn 12 different income streams and that's what we do. So it's like whatever we need to do to make it work. So um, over the years, we have evolved to where we started with just doing what I'd called consignment sales. So we couldn't afford to like buy your product outright so we would sell it and then give you X you know, percent, less the percent that we took. We still do that, we take 20%, and that is supposed to cover all of our operations, distribution, and the farmer is responsible for buying boxes that we buy in bulk, um, and they are responsible for grading it and just getting it to the facility ready to go. Um, we also buy and sell product because we sell produce. We don't live in Florida or California, so we've got six months of the year where we've got no cash flow whatsoever. So we have then just started buying and selling produce from farther afield. Um, right now we're in a, in a project with the Deep South folks in Mississippi and Alabama to try and help them get some access to some of the markets that we have. Um, we have had probably triple the demand for product every year at least, that we have supply. So supply is always the problem. And, and evening out supply is always our problem. So we can do stuff that's moving around. So we do this buying and selling. We would then get the money to buy from you and, or, or buy from another um, produce broker and then sell. But the whole point of that is to make money on that transaction so that we can funnel it back in to pay for the operations. Um, we looked around at our assets and our assets are our building and our trucks. And so we were trying to figure out what can we do with those assets. And we um, had assets that you could barely call assets in terms of trucks. Um, one had 600,000 miles on it and the other one had eight. 
And the one that had 600 probably had eight because the odometer had quit working long before. <laughs> so, and I mean, so it, we identified a about a year and a half ago, we have got to do something about this. Um, and partly because we had budgeted in our 2015 budget, $34,000 in truck repairs alone. And, and you just, you know, you just can't survive that way. And so we started really working with experts. And that's, if I could give you one recommendation is not to, do not recreate the wheel. And that's one of the things I just think is, I admire about Cleta is because they are so honest about seeking advice and, and going to the experts and, and talking to them. And the experts told us, well, of course you can't function if you've got those ancient trucks. Nobody keeps those trucks. That's why you can buy them for cheap because they get rid of them. And so we got, we now have two brand new tractors and one brand new trailer. We still have a, a, a one trailer that's a bit old, but not anywhere near where we were. And we're hoping that that will really push us over the edge of profitability because you can afford to do more hauling. So when I have on here backhaul and for hire, we never are, we're never empty for more than just a very short, short haul. It takes a long time to get that expertise if you didn't start with it. And it takes a long time for people to be willing to talk to you. I mean, for years we were saying, well, we want a backhaul. And they're like, your truck may not even make it. Why would I trust you with my stuff, you know, with your little RV air conditioner on your, on your box truck? So, um, it, but now we're more credible and reliable. Um, you, I would say that you know one of the lessons that we learned is I avoided tractor trailers for the longest time because they scared me because you had to have a CDL license and where we were I couldn't hardly even find anybody without a CDL that I'd want driving a truck um, which was totally wrong thinking I, I don't know now in retrospect I'm like really that was stupid CDL drivers actually might be better if you just pay them a little better and so we've got awesome drivers now and so we're protected you know a little bit more but but what we did learn is that a tractor trailer is the cheapest per unit. That's why we do it in this country because it's the cheapest way to get product from point A to point B. Um, we also um, used to, and this is another cautionary thing, we used to grade product because we thought, well, by golly, Farmers need that help. They need us to help grade their product. By that, I mean you just field grade it, leave the, leave the obviously bad stuff in the field, and bring it up to us, and we'll wash it, and we'll label it with stickers, and we'll size it right. And we're going to do that with a labor force that couldn't care less about doing that, is only employed for maybe four months out of the year, and we can pay them hardly anything. It was brilliant. So we were horrible at it, horrible. And every year, I'd like, my God, we're going to be better this year. We're going to be better. And I'd change it every year and change the fees to get the, to get the farmers to stop bringing a bunch of junk in, because if they didn't leave the stuff in the field, I mean, just do the math. It doesn't work. And finally, I was like, OK, you're unhappy, farmer. We're unhappy. We're all losing money. And so we just stopped doing it. And I was like, why did I not do that years ago? And so when I'm talking to, to little fledgling people who are talking about a food hub and they're, we're in a grade, and I'm like, oh, no, don't start there. Just don't start there. Um, my advice would be start with the most minimum of services you could possibly do because it's sort of like if you've ever built a house or a building and you double your budget and you just know that that will, that will mean that you won't go over budget and you're always wrong. Same with this. Um, you're, you're never going to be right on that. Um, uh, our business model for this um, enterprise is also, we, in, in 2011, we had a think tank. We brought 25 people in from across the country to tell us what we were doing wrong, to tell us should we keep even doing this. And, and it was the most painful and informative thing I have ever done. I mean, it was sort of the guy who facilitated said, be nice, and then they're going to get up, take off their clothes. And I'm like, oh, God, but that's right. I mean, it was like you had to be really honest if you really wanted the feedback. One of the things that they said to us is the thing that we value the most about you. And we had three big buyers there, um, was that you teach young farmers and you're growing new farmers. But one of the things that is the most costly for you is just that very activity. So what we've done is we've separated the way we track this information in our financials. So the things that are transaction-based, like the buying and selling and, and hauling, is all managed like a business. And it is, you know, that is what we're tracking for profitability. Things that are nonprofit, like doing a lot of training and, and gap education and that type of thing, um, are all 
if they're grant funded, they are tracked separately so that we can ebb and flow with what we have um, managed to get from grants. And it has made a world of difference in how we look and how we staff and, and just how we approach it. And, and that was probably the most valuable thing. Um, and John, I assume you'll do this when, yeah. then I, when I should stop. Um, I, I, this, what you probably can't see, especially if I'm standing in front of it, is um, every year we get with our buyers to do production planning. And I, I again, another um, naive moment of mine, I thought, well, that, this is great. So we have always been able to get our buyers to say, we want 200 cases of that a week, we want 50 cases of this, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, we'll just translate that to restaurants. That'll be no problem. Yeah, well, it doesn't work at all, um, it, it, at all. And so I, I, cause I thought, I had this beautiful vision that we would capture this for restaurants and other small retailers, <coughs> and it doesn't happen. It can happen at a large wholesale level just because they're used to thinking like that. And so what we've done every year is we've gone to our buyers and we've said, well, how many of these do you need? We we'd roll all that up and then we'd convert it into plant populations and phases, plant phases so that we can then go to you and say, if you will grow this, we know we can sell it. And, and we plan it out. Now, does it always work? No, it never works like it's supposed to because the last few years, you know, the first and second phases because of weather have all backed up and then we have nothing and glut ourselves. But if you don't do anything, you're, you're really gonna be in a mess. Um, for the most part, our farmers have been really pleased with this process. What we haven't been pleased with is our ability to predict. Our, our farmers have not, are not the greatest at forecasting and it's partly because they're such small scale farmers that it's just, you know, the difference between one and 10 boxes may be huge to us, but it's, you know, it's just, it's a challenge. So you'll, you'll see in the a little green things there where we have like 90%, 75%. We have decided this year to char start assigning um, risk factors to some of what we do. And this is just, again, I, like sometimes when I get stressed, it's either office supplies or Excel. And this is another, like, we gotta figure this out. And so we have, this year we're, doing um, risk factors on our buyers. So you'll see, we, Ingalls is one of our favorite buyers. So we are saying that we'll probably get 90% of that. Um, we're then on the grower side gonna say, you are brand new and you have decided heirloom tomatoes are the only thing you're willing to grow. So we're probably gonna give you a really high risk factor, meaning you may have committed to 50% of our demand, but we'll believe that we'll get like 5%. So we're trying to do a better job of forecasting because we don't wanna stop recruiting growers. If, if we you know, don't really think it's gonna materialize in anything. We're probably about the eight, eight and a half million total sales um, for the Appalachian Harvest Enterprise at this point. And, and the last count, I think it's probably six or 650,000, something like that, pounds of food that we've been able to buy and donate to the food banks and food pantries. Um, and we have, on the kind of nonprofit side, we have trained hundreds of farmers on GAP, and it's not just farmers who grow for Appalachian Harvest. It's just farmers really across Virginia. In fact, we're working with the Virginia Department of Ag to try and, and make that a very a statewide regular activity that isn't um, kind of every year we get grant funding and we hope we can do it. It's GAP, if you've not, are any of y'all GAP certified? Good agricultural practices. It's a food safety um, certification that is not legislated yet, but it's soon to be required. And it's all about, you know, at what level is it required? But it doesn't really matter if it's not legislated. If your buyers say you must have it, then it's it doesn't really matter what the government says. Yeah, this is um, this is on the farm, and our manual is this thick. So you can imagine how excited farmers are when you bring that out, because they got into that to do paper. They got into farming to do paperwork for sure, and <laughs> and some of them just like, I'm not going to farm anymore. We had one farmer up there who didn't even he doesn't even sell through us, and but he sells to one of our partners, and he had decided I, I'm not doing it. I mean his fields are planted, but I'm not doing it. And then two weeks before he needs to sell, he's like, Oh God, what am I going to do? Nobody will buy it. And so we managed to cobble something together and get him certified like that so that he could still sell his products. And he, he's managing, 
but, but, but we've tried to make it as simple as possible. But as simple as possible means an eight-hour Saturday in a classroom going through all this. Then it is translating this on your farm. Then it is having a, someone come out and probably help you develop your standard operating pr procedures. And then we, because we've been able to get grant funding, do um, mock audits. Because an audit is really expensive. Um, in our case, the only auditor is, and I thought this was bad until I started working with the Deep South folks, and my God, don't even get me started on that. Our inspector, our auditor, comes four or five hours one way. They charge you 91 bucks an hour, plus travel and all that. So what we've started doing is grouping everybody together. And I don't know how long our auditor will do that because it's kind of a beating for him, but it's like, cool. So we have five or six people he has to do when he's down there. So they all share that travel cost. And he's been really nice and accommodating, but I don't know how much longer that will go on. Um, so we have, we get calls all the time because the word was out that we were like some blindingly amazing success. And I kept saying, it, by whose definition is this a success? Because it's a beating and we're not profitable. And, and I guess my business background is telling me, how can we be this wild success if we're still going, oh God, I hope we get this grant so we can stay open. That's, that's not success to me, but that's, again, I'm maybe coming at it from a different lens. But we do get a lot of calls. And so I took some of these questions that I just, I just popped them in here um, just to kind of see if um, I didn't make sure I didn't miss, miss anything. A lot of people, um, a lot of different hubs are maybe co-ops or they have a membership fee. We did not. We do not. Um, we suffered from, I think, the Statue of Liberty kind of behavior, in my opinion. We had all this supply, all this demand. So come grow for us. We'll do anything to have you grow for us. And it was like, we didn't even make it like a challenge. We just, we were just desperate. And, and you don't really set the right tone that way. So I am not um, opposed to membership fees. We just didn't start that way. And if I had it to do over again, I would really make this more of a, an exclusive club that you should want to join versus send us your huddled masses of anybody. And, and, it, and it, it's really not the right way to operate. Um, we also get asked if we do contracts. We do not have contracts with either buyers or growers. And so this year I decided that's going to change. We're going to change that. So I wrote up this grower agreement and, and put it um, out to some really amazing partners that we have. And they're like, well, I wouldn't sign that. And I'm like, oh, that must be why I haven't done it. So there you go. Um, and, and they don't need to. And so why would they? However, I want to make it clear what my responsibility is, is and what yours are. And then if, if one of us doesn't behave, then at least we know what we should have been doing. Buyers, how do you get a buyer to sign a contract you never fulfill? What, what is that going to look like? We are always short, always. And they deal with us anyway because they, they love access to small scale farmers. So they can deal with us and they can get access to 50, 60 farmers. Um, but a contract with them would be laughable. Have, have they agreed at least not to buy direct from farmers? Or do they, do they buy straight? Or do they buy direct from Typically, it's about the challenge of small farmers that we work with getting there. So it's, it's, a lot of times it's the, the practicality of the distance more than anything. And, um, and also, we have a $5 million liability policy that kind of insulates them. And, and they know that they have a lot of processes with us that, that are kind of a value add almost for them. But no, they haven't. Because like, we've had farmers who defected. Sure and decided to go, and, and that's a challenge for me because our goal is to help the farmers. Our goal is to not have Appalachian Harvest become some giant enterprise. And so if they can fly on their own, isn't that better for them? And so it's, that's a really, that's why I'm not a big fan of nonprofits being in this, in this position because are you competing with them? Because that's not good. Um, we also get questions about whether we have a minimum order or um, a minimum um, supply requirement. From an order perspective, when you're talking the Appalachian harvest business, it's tractor trailer loads. So we're not gonna roll the tractor trailer up to your business to deliver you a box. It's just not gonna happen. And so 
it's more, can we make a load make sense? And if you're maybe one stop on it, cool. Um, for instance, one of the things that we do is we'll fill up a 53-foot trailer, and we'll go drop half of that at, our, at the Ingalls location, which is um, maybe two and a half, three hours away. We then go someplace else that's maybe 20 minutes from there, and we offload a little bit more product with somebody else who goes to Charlotte, North Carolina. We take that person's product, put it on our truck, and go to Atlanta, or just north of Atlanta. Then we go into Atlanta, and we pick up, because we, um, we've dropped off, our, our trailer is empty, we go into Atlanta and we pick up dog food or baby formula or whatever, and then we haul it back up to Abingdon. And that way we're only empty, or a little bit empty, just different pieces. So when people ask about the minimum, it's just like, how does it fit in all of that, that we have fi finally figured out how to make the distribution make financial sense. Of course, you got to have decent um, equipment. We got to where we didn't even be allowed to, ha to haul dog food. How sad is that? Um, because our trailer, the, it was so bad it was ripping the bags. So yeah, that does go back to that. Um, minimum requirement for producers, I put them up there because we work with farmers that can get a bushel of beans together. And if, that, if they can get a bushel, we can sell it. But we can't take, well, we'll we got six tomatoes, that's probably not appropriate for this market. So we don't really have a floor on that as much. Um, uh, we did have, a, we had um, a lot of questions about delivery. Delivery is just something that you have to figure out. For the longest time, we kind of knew we were losing money, but we didn't know how badly we were losing money. Um, for the longest time, we didn't have a DOT number. And we would just instruct our drivers to just go that route, and then you can miss the station, which is not something I should I admit in every crowd, but it was like, well, we'll just be ignorant. Um, so um, produce getting to the facility is done by farmers. Um, we do a lot of backhauling from different drop-off points, um, but we don't do a lot of on-the-farm pickups. If you're going to do anything like this, what you have to do is figure out how much that costs you. The in industry... Um, uh, number is that at least a couple of years ago it was $75 every time you stop a tractor trailer. And if, if you don't know what that number is, how do you know whether it makes sense for you to stop and pick up six boxes? That being said, when you get started, you've got to be a whole lot more flexible than when, you, when you're at a more mature level. Um, uh, another a quick question um, that we've had on equipment. I put that picture up there because that big green monster is my um, ode to stupidity or blinding um, optimism that we thank God no longer have because it just sat there accusing me of, of really not understanding what on earth I was doing. Is we bought this piece of equipment because it was going to grade everything, it was going to size things, it was going to be great, and it took 10 people to run it. And we never had enough product that came through that could even go through the machine. It was, it, was, it was a really depressing, poorly executed decision. So think about that. You know, you can, everybody should have that kind of a hideous reminder. Um, I already mentioned that. Um, there's just one or two other things that I will mention because I know I need to stop. But um, I've already mentioned the breaking even financially. Um, I would just caution you to recognize the context in which you work. Um, and recognize the assets that you have here because you have a lot. And how you come up with what you do will not be what we do. Um, in fact, I, I would strongly suspect that it shouldn't be. Um, it should be probably a combination of restaurant and wholesale and, and have wholesale partners and restaurant partners that are really driving this. I mean, y'all are so fortunate, as I said, to have Cleta because they get it. And, and they're not going to try and insert themselves because they want to become a permanent fixture in the food system. They want it to be an economic opportunity for this region, and it totally can be. Um, and I think that is, oh, one other thing, just on the trucks. Um, I put this up there partly because I'm mad at Penske. Nobody's from Penske, are they? Well, maybe if you are, we should talk. Um, <laughs> right now, we have leased one truck, and we are, have gotten grant funding to buy another. The lease, um, you, it takes you three months to get your truck. The second day that we had our rental from them, it burned to the ground, and um, it's going on our insurance. 
even though it was their truck. And so you look at things and you make the best decision you can at the time, but just be prepared for it to totally not work out. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I think it, what it is about to me is making sure that you manage your risk to the best of your ability. I mean, then you just got to be prepared to deal with whatever happens. Um, I just feel like that's, it's become my new poster child for, hmm, well, that's nice. Um, and also, one last thing is infrastructure. If you can avoid it, and this is on the same thing with risk, if you can avoid owning a building, why wouldn't you? Why would you incur those costs? We are no longer nimble because we have a building that we have to feed. It has a $2,000 a month electricity and debt and everything else associated with it, and we can't be as flexible. We've got to stay with the markets that we have established that are really big because we need that to feed the building. And you don't want to get into the building feeding mode. It just doesn't make sense, especially when you've got empty buildings around you and, and don't want to have to own more. So. Anyway, done? Yeah, and I just want to open it up for questions. Sure. How, you said, you'll have to excuse me, I think I wrote it down and I couldn't remember the You said you had five or eight million in sales right now? No, we're at 1.5 about. Right. We're really hoping to hit around two. Okay, so what my question was though, how, how, how much are your largest producers producing for you? What we have found, and I think that it's pretty similar to most others, is you've got really big ones and really small ones. And um, you know, the biggest ones might be a couple hundred thousand, maybe three hundred thousand, um, and then just down to you know, like one guy brings in, oh look, he brought eggs in this month, you know, and that's it. Um, and so it's just a pretty broad spectrum. But if you don't have the big guys, it doesn't work. It, it, and, and that's, I think, where sometimes the model, people think, oh, it's so beautiful, we're gonna help all these little tiny farmers, and it's like, no, you're not, because you're gonna go out of business, because you can't live with just that. You have to have enough volume to move product. Um, it, it's different, again, if you're real urban, if you're, real, if you're like outside of DC, it's probably not as hard. It is hard when it's rural. What relationship do you have with your public health regionally? Um, uh, that's, and it's interesting you would ask that. Lately, we've been doing, because we've been doing this for a while, we've been trying to convene some different groups of folks. And one of the groups that we're trying to work with is what is that intersection between healthcare, public health, and, um, and food? And, and that's really early. We're just now starting to work with that. We have, we run the Appalachian Farmers Market Association, which there's about 35 farmers markets in just our small footprint. And our association is responsible for helping to improve those and, and help them succeed. Um, and we also then funnel money into those markets that double their SNAP, double SNAP benefits. Um, and, and as a part of that, we're trying to do more outreach with public health. Um, it's, it's early though, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear that, that y'all have, y'all are ahead of us, I think, on that partly because you have, I'm gonna say it wrong, and I've, I've practiced it, repeat it, yeah, whatever, I'm not gonna get it right. <laughs> and you're, so y'all can say Appalachia to me. Um, You're multi-jurisdictional, and mm -hmm. most health departments are county-based. Mm -hmm. Ours is regional. That's so it has a lovely. Structure that's yeah. different. Well, and, and I know that in, the, in Virginia, they are trying to, I, I was dealing with someone, a funder the other day, and she was like, Virginia's just a mess. And you wouldn't think it is, but it is, they don't, there's not a lot of, of cohesion, and, and it's got, and it's maybe similar here, you know, you have the Appalachian part of Virginia, you've got, you know, up near D.C., the Richmond area, and, and you've just got a lot of different, really disparate areas, and none of them are working together, and, and then you layer on multiple sectors like that, and then they, it, it's a mess. But, but the new um, Virginia governor is allegedly putting some focus on that. That was negative. We'll see. <laughs> Question over there. Uh, do you call or, or have producers uh, for like cut flowers or live plants? We haven't. Um, a lot of the ones that do that in our, the farmers that do that in our area are um, selling those more locally at farmers markets, 
um, and, and to maybe some small retailers. None of them, especially, um, we, we have another little uh, enterprise that we're working on, which is called Rooted in Appalachia, and that is, was created in recognition of the fact that we don't want to haul all of our product to Atlanta. We would like to actually have some of it be staying in our area, but it needs to be a demand for it. So we're trying to raise demand. So we started doing little restaurant deliveries, and we're, and we're looking at possibly doing cut flowers as a part of that, but we have not started that yet. Mm -hmm. And um, specifically, like, are there farmers that are at the table for the decisions that you guys are making? Can you just say more about that? That's a, that's a really good question. And, and it has been different over the years. Um, when I was saying how I was, like, beating my head against the wall about grading and how do you figure out what to charge, we would have a group of farmers come together to really – and I was – ASD had not been totally transparent, I didn't feel. And so I'm like, fine, here, look. You tell me what we should charge you because I don't know what to do if, if you don't, you know, you need to see what our financials are. And so um, over the years, as we have become more transparent, I think they've had a little more trust in us. Um, we have always had farmers on our board, um, and, and we still do. The more complex an organization gets, I think the more difficult it is for people to even understand how to weigh in. So um, I believe that the most successful hubs are owned by or run by farmers not like we are. And people have kind of stepped back and let us do it because it's working. And I'm, that is our reality, but I don't think that's the right way to be. Is there a portion of that group of farmers that have been reached out to, do you find that um, there's a portion, like a significant amount of them are young and beginning farmer and ranchers? I have noticed, I, I really, you know, you, there's, a, there's a huge tension between conventional and organic farmers. And, and there is almost an equal tension between new and beginning and, and the more experienced farmers. And I have layered on to that. I've noticed that in our area, the ones that are closer to the, the towns and the, the larger cities that we have are, are the newer, more, the younger um, beginning farmer and ranchers versus the ones that are really far away. It's really interesting. And, and we are trying our best to not be divisive, to be very inclusive, to get everybody at the table. That is no small task, particularly since we spent the first probably eight years, nine years of our existence ticking most of the ones who were really um, entrenched off. And so we were, but, but we're being very deliberate now about that. I mean, um, and, and that's a hard thing to do. We, um, we work with people who do. Um, we try and get our farmers to put hives out. Um, and we, um, we have, in fact, we were just talking the other day that we have some land next to our building that would be really cool to do some sort of um, hive set up there. We haven't figured out yet. That's not an area of expertise yet, but, but we definitely um, have dabbled in it just a little bit. Yes. When they bring their food in. We, kind of we, our terms for um, our buyers are net 10, and our terms for the farmers are that we will pay them within 14 days. Um, some, some buyers are awesome about the net 10, and others are like, yeah, right, uh, net 30 plus. Um, so 14 days is about what we pay. Um, we don't pay them like when they walk in the door. I mean, that would be wonderful, but it would be wonderful for them, but it doesn't also protect you from bad grower behavior. So if you have rejections um, or you have to issue protection on something um, with your buyers, you're not protected very well if you pay them right then and there. You would pay them less, I think, just to protect yourself. And if you have more questions with Catherine, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity for a couple more workshops with her too. So. Uh, ask away. But I definitely want to thank you for uh, that presentation.